Sunday. Oh, it's good. Any football fans out there? Oh, yes. Right there, we got Heath Potter with his self-purchase belt. That's amazing. We love you. God bless you. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. Football is here. We're starting this new series. It's a perfect Sunday to start this series. You know, fall is in the air. It smells. Oh, it's just good. I love this. I love it. I love it. I love it. There's just like this, this, this boost of energy that was in my, my little pep in my step this morning. I was just excited. So we're going to get going here. But first, I got to ask this here. Uh, we're, we're starting this series called Not a Fan. I, I know we got some fans in the crowd today. Where are my Chiefs fans? <laughs> That was much louder, I think, than the first experience. I like that. All right. Is there anybody in here that maybe is a Rams fan? Okay. There's more in the second service than there was in the first. That's good. Um, anybody Packers fans? Yeah. Okay. I don't think we had any Packers. Oh, my mom is calling out the Bears. Where's the Bears? Yes. <laughs> uh, let's see who else we got. Is there anybody in here that's a Colts fan? <laughs> There they are. So Jeff, meet the other Colts fan. Um, there you go. <laughs> oh, yes. Mm, it's luck. It's luck. We have anybody in here that's... Uh... Oh, Broncos. Are there any Broncos? Yeah. Oh, they just they don't even wait. They're just obnoxious. They just say... Uh, they just... <laughs> you could be right. What about this? Are there any Cowboys fans in there? I don't know how there's so many Cowboys fans in the crowd every time. <laughs> oh, oh. You know what, though? Tony Romo has recovered well from his ovary removal. He's good. Like, he's, he's, he's ready to go today. And then, uh, <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Oh, Tony, oh, Tony. Anybody else? I don't want to I I feel bad. Who else have we got? Li Lions? Did you say the Lions? I'm from Michigan. She's from Michigan. Even Michigan fans don't like the Lions. Like, <laughs> God bless you. Vi is there? Yeah. Well, uh, Vikings. Are, what? Vikings? Okay. All right. Wow. We have a diverse crowd. Uh, Saints? Anybody? Saints? No. I don't want. I don't want anybody else. The Steelers. We had two Steeler fans in the first crowd. One of them wouldn't yell. So congratulations. <laughs> awesome. Anybody else? Okay. Sooners. Sooners. Pray. We need. We need to pray for the Patriots. Because uh, hold on, I'm getting some interference. In What's that? I'll get some interference. <laughs> hold on, I'm getting some interference. I'm just picking up impacts of broadcast. That's all I can hear is. Uh, <laughs> Oh, there we go. 49ers? Yes, yes. Okay. Well, all right. Sooners, yes. I know. Hey, congratulations, Sooners. You came back and won one yesterday. That's good. We're going to move forward and just not talk about the SEC today. You're just going to right past that. Anyway, we're starting this series. It's called Not a Fan. And you know what? We're, you know, we, we know what fandom is. We know what fandom is. You can see by my, my shirt today, I know what it is to be a fan, okay? But... What kid, whose kid, what kid actually ends up going into the lemonade business? Anybody out there ever have a lemonade stand growing up? You had one? Yes? Right here? Had a lemonade stand? Anybody actually sell any lemonade when they had a lemonade stand? Oh, my gosh. You know, it's funny. L Julie, or Julie, Libby, uh, whenever Julie does rummage sales, Libby and Bella, they love to do a lemonade stand. And so we've, uh, we always support that. And it's good because we, we, we've, we've told them, helped them a little bit with their marketing and said, you know what, don't put a price on your lemonade. Just put on there by donation only. 
give how you feel. <laughs> like, if it's that good, you know. So, but then we also took it another step further because they were trying to raise money for one of our trips. And we put this little sign on the front of the table that said, our mom and dad said that they would match whatever we made today in our, our lemonade stand. Well, when people saw that and they started feeling like sorry for them, so like, they were like laying down 10s and 20s. And these little girls made more money at their lemonade stand than we did at the rummage sale. You know what I'm saying? So I told Julie we should just start doing a lemonade stand. Forget the other part. Like, but anyway, you've seen these kids before. Maybe you, you or your kid tries it out one afternoon. Uh, but, but there really are professional lemonade stands that exist in this world. A couple weeks ago, we went down to Branson to Civil Dollar City. And all my wife wanted to find was the frozen lemonade. Like, where's that frozen lemonade? Frozen lemonade. Oh, they have strawberry frozen lemonade. You know, it's, it, someone put strawberries in it. It's so good. But you have to think that there was one day, there was a day that somebody had this lemonade stand, and it just kept, you know, like maybe little Jeff has the lemonade stand as a little kid, you know, he's out there. And in the beginning, people felt sorry for him because he's wearing the cold jersey and he's selling lemonade. They're like, okay. <laughs> We'll, we'll buy your lemonade. We'll come over and we'll buy some. But it goes further and further. And it's like, you know what? The lemonade's actually pretty good. And so then someone's like, hey, we're going to have a little, a little carnival or a little fair in town. Hey, why don't you come up and set up your lemonade stand? And all of a sudden, it starts getting a little popular. It starts selling some lemonade. And people start inviting Jeff out to all the, the city of functions and sell lemonade and sell a lemonade. And it gets a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. And all of a sudden it's taking on a life of its own. And Jeff's having to worry about the quality of lemons he gets and the, and the, the, the content, the sugar content, because they have to know about the nutrition facts now. And it starts becoming a legitimate business. And there comes a point where he's going to start making a spreadsheet. And you know, if he's going to keep growing, he's got to hire more workers and there has to be a quality control and it gets bigger and it gets bigger and it gets bigger. And there has to be a point when he's doing this, where he has to make a decision. He has to do something. He has to have what's called a DTR moment, a DTR moment where he has to define whether or not this is going to be something that's going to be a career or if this is just something that's a hobby. It was just something, you know, it was, it was fun while it lasted. But there comes a point where you've got to, def- to decide it's, it's gotten serious. So when someone went into the lemonade business, like Jamba Juice, maybe that's why Jamba Juice started. I don't know. Maybe that's why Starbucks. I don't know. But I'm just saying that there was a point where that's how something like that started. But we can also look at this sometimes, and it's better depicted, and we can relate to it with relationships. Um, We've got something that kind of shares that right here. Check this out. DTR. Some of you will recognize what those letters stand for. If you're not sure, let me help you out. If you are a young man in a relationship with a young woman, then uh, chances are these letters are enough to strike fear into your heart. You may run away from, postpone, you may dread the DTR talk. Some young men will even terminate a relationship if they feel like the DTR talk is imminent. It is that official talk that takes place in every romantic relationship. Do you know what it stands for, DTR? Define the relationship. You sit down and you decide where things are going. Have things moved from casual to committed? I remember this uh, date I went on in high school. On the very first date, the girl tried to have the DTR talk with me. First date, DTR. I got out of their PDQ. I just ran away. Talking about the DTR, the DTR, define the relationship. So over the next several weeks, over these next few weeks, I want all of us to examine our relationships, though, with Jesus. I want us to look at our relationships with Jesus. Now, I get the fact that for some of you, this is kind of a first aid. It's easy for you just to to, to sit and listen and be in the room, but we all need to just be looking at what our relationship with Jesus is like. And so for us to do that, we need to define the relationship and figure out where we stand with Jesus. And as we look at this, and we can look at Christ's invitation, I want us to look at this verse. So if you have your Bible, we're going to put it up on the screen. You can open up to you version. I want us to check out this verse, Luke 9, 23. Luke 9, 23, and it says this right here. We have, it says, then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple, this is Jesus talking, must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. And he said to them, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. So if we look at this and we think, uh, many of us may welcome this DTR talk, the define the relationship talk. Well, that's what Jesus is having right here in this, this, this scripture is saying, he's, you know what? You need to define the relationship. What is this? If you're going to be my disciple, you have to be all in. If you're going to be my disciple, it's got to be committed. 
if you're going to be my disciple, you got to put a ring on it. You know what I'm saying? Like he's saying that that's the way it's got to be. Because a lot of us in this room, you're ready to move to a different level of commitment. And we're going to talk about what that looks like in this room. You're ready to move past the casual, past the convenient, into something more devoted. You know what that's like. You ever been in a dating relationship? There comes a point where she expects a little more than just, you know, we need to DTR, define the relationship. And that's that moment of truth where as men, we either step up and we be men or we stay boys and run and go along on our way. So today, that's what we're talking about. You know, we can look at this and we can, we can look at this with Jesus. I mean, he's a nice guy. You know, we come in here, look at me. I'm a nice guy. You look at the church, you know, the, the churches. It's okay. The band, they're pretty good. The people in here, they're kind of friendly. You know, it's easy to come in and sit and listen. It's easy to come in and, and just be casual. But we need to look at today. Are we a fan or are we a follower? So here's what we want to do. I want us to ask this question. Are you a fan or a follower of Jesus Christ? Are you a fan or a follower of Jesus Christ? Now, some of you are wondering why I would ask a question like that, because it's like, hey, we're here today, Shane. We're obviously all followers of Jesus Christ because we're in the room. I mean, why else? We, why would we get up on a Sunday and come in here? You know, this is a day, football starts for crying out loud, and it's a day off. Why would we get up and come into the room today if we weren't followers of Jesus Christ? Well, don't jump to your answer too quickly. I want you to hear me out. The word fan is defined as an enthusiastic follower. Everyone say enthusiastic follower. Enthusiastic follower. I like that. Well, I am an enthusiastic follower of the Kansas City Chiefs. <laughs> we have a lot of people in the room wearing jerseys today. We're enthusiastic followers, and that's okay. I'm just a fan, though, of the Chiefs. Jeff is a fan of the Colts. Sonny is a fan of the Cowboys. Derek's a fan of the Sooners. Uh, Jared's a fan of the Bears. And that's okay. That's a beautiful thing to be a fan. I'm an enthusiastic fan, admirer. We're all fans of different things. Many of us for sports. We watch the games. We cheer on our team. Some of us have the jerseys of our favorite players. We understand the concept of being a fan of sports. But my concern is that the church can simply turn into a room full of fans of Jesus. A room full of fans of Jesus because that's what a lot of us can do. It can become very easy for us to come into the church on a Sunday morning and be a fan of Jesus. We come in here like, oh man, I, I, you know, I love to hear a message preached. I love to hear the worship team sing. I love the songs. You know, you know the songs by heart. You know what it's like. You come in and we can sit here and we can sit in the, the stands in the crowd on a Sunday morning and cheer for Jesus and then leave and go right on about our very day. And we will fill the stands when life is good. We will fill the, 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 the chairs when life is good, when the team is winning. But when the, when the team isn't winning, you ever seen what stadiums look like when their team isn't winning? Remember Kaufman two years ago? Oh, now they got a bunch of Fairweather fans. <laughs> said, they set a record attendance this year, a record attendance because their team is winning. And that's okay, for, that's okay for sports. That's okay for sports. But Jesus is asking for something much more than an enthusiastic admirer. Because you see, here's the thing. Jesus didn't care much just for fans. He wasn't interested in having fans. And I get the fact that some of you are really big fans. I mean, you're really into all of this. You know the songs. You know the page numbers of, of the scripture that I would say, that I would shout out. And maybe some of you, you, know, you look around the room and you're the first one to it. Or you get your U version open faster than everybody else. Or whatever. You're really good at being a fan. And we can feel pretty good about ourselves at being these great admirers of Christ. But he never cared about just being an admirer of him or just being a fan. So if we'll be honest with ourselves today. And that's what I want us to do. If we'll be honest with ourselves, if we really search our hearts, we have to begin to define the relationship today with Jesus. We have to ask ourselves, we have to define the relationship, we have to ask ourselves three questions. How do we define the relationship with Jesus? Three questions to determine if we are a fan or a follower. And the first thing I would ask you to ask yourself is this, why am I here? So let's all say that right now. Why am I here? Why are you here? Why are you here today? Why are you in the room? If you read through the Gospels, Jesus at different points in his ministry would draw a line in the sand, and he would separate the fans from the followers. 
And I can, you know, there's been a time in my life where I've had to do the same thing. Where Jesus, you know, there was a line drawn in the sand for me with my relationship and following him. And I can remember when I came to, to know Jesus, I would kind of get close to that line and I would kind of dip my toes in the water. I would kind of put my, line, my foot over that line and I would experience a little bit of what it was to, to, to follow Jesus. And then I would go back to what was familiar because it scared me or because my, my friends or my comfort or my familiarity or what I knew, it was a scary thing to go over that line, to be fully committed. And I would waver back and forth and then I wouldn't like myself because of the things that I would do and I would just go back and forth in this tug of war with flirting with that line. And that's exactly what I want us to talk about today is Jesus would draw this line in the sand. On what such instance in John chapter six, Jesus is in the height of his ministry. He's in the height of his ministry and we read that large crowds were following Jesus. He was popular. He was working miracles. I want you to remember that. He was providing food from just five loaves of bread and two fish. And a lot of people were in the crowd following Jesus. But Jesus in verse 2 realizes why they were coming. In verse 2, it says, And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs that he had performed by healing the sick. So Jesus gathers this. He ascertains from the moment. He says, The main reason that these crowds are showing up is because of the spectacle. I mean, you got to think about it. We have to rationalize what, what's going on the moment for just a little bit. There's no YouTube. There's no TV. There's no newspapers. There's nothing like that that exists at this point in time. There's no traveling circuses. There's, 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 there's no nothing that, that exists. And so they hear of this Jesus, and word travels like wildfire, and they want to see the things that this man is doing, the, the, the people that he's raising from the dead, the water that he's changing into wine. They want to see the, 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 the woman be made. They want to see the things. And Jesus has almost become a spectacle, a sideshow, if you will. And so people would come and they would gather in these huge crowds because it caused a ruckus. And then Jesus says, but you know what? They're not following to follow. They were fans. And I've been that person before. There was a guy that came through here a couple years ago I wanted to see. Even in this modern day, there was a kid that played for Hillcrest. He was a wide receiver and he was the talk of the town. His name was Doro Green Beckham, and he went on and played at MU. And he was the talk of the town. He played for Hillcrest up in Springfield, Missouri. And he was coming to Joplin, and he was going to play football here at Joplin. And so guess what? I went that night because I wanted to see the spectacle. Was I a fan? Was I a follower? No. But I wanted to see. I was just like these people that were following Jesus that wanted to see this, the show, wanted to see this Jesus. I wanted to see this DGB. You get what I'm saying? So that they were following just for the spectacle. They didn't care as much about the teaching as they did about the life-changing lesson. They were there for the show. So I have to ask today with everyone in the room, why are you here? What is your because? Is it because you like the free coffee? Is it because you like the water? Is it because the chairs are comfy? We could have forked out more for the chairs and been even more comfy, but we didn't. They could have been less comfortable, but they're not. What is it? Is it the music? You like the music? Is, it, is the preaching? Is it? It's okay. Why? What is your because? Is, 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 is it because you have kids in your family and, and you want them to, to meet good friends? Are you here because your wife wants to go and you know, you're like, well, she's my wife and I want to keep her happy? Maybe, it's, maybe you're a wife. I don't know. You're invited by a friend. What is it? What is it? What is your because? But at some point, there has to be a point where we have to define the relationship. Why are you here? And in that passage, Jesus challenged these fans to a deeper, more intimate relationship with him. And verse 66 shares this. In verse 66, it says, From this time, many of his disciples turned his back and no longer followed him. I just want to focus on 66 right there. When Jesus asked for them to define the relationship... Many of his disciples turned their back and no longer followed him. A lot of them went home because Jesus says, let's define what we've got here. Let's look at what this really is. Are we going to start dating? Is it, it going to get serious? Are we going to go steady? What does the relationship look like? He offered 
What he offered wasn't what they wanted. And maybe it's time for just some people here to just go home. You've come for a while and you understand things, and yet you're coming in for just the miracles, for just for the show, just for the way it makes you feel, just because you want to check off the list, oh, I went to church. Now, I'm not saying I want anybody to go home. Don't, don't misinterpret that at all. But I want you to determine the why, the because. Why are you here? For Jesus, his because is that we, he wants us to develop a deep relationship with him. Jesus' because is he wants us. He wants us. The second question we have to ask ourselves is this. Are you all in? And I want us to say it this way. I want everybody in the room to say, am I all in? So right now, together, I want us to physically say those words. Am I all in? Being a follower of Jesus requires complete commitment. A follower of Jesus will do whatever it takes to follow Jesus. They're absolutely loyal, completely committed. They are Chiefs fans. <laughs> Bad joke. Bad joke. Just a joke. But deeply committed, deeply loyal. On the whole, we don't do too well with absolute commitment, do we? I think we prefer a selective commitment. Simply put, we customize Christianity like it's this buffet, and we can walk through and pick the things in the Bible that we like, that we're comfortable with, that we really want to do. Like, oh, there's these things in the Bible I can, you know, I can get. I'm not going to murder somebody. I'm down with that. I want to love others. I want to serve others. But there's some things that make me a little uncomfortable that I just don't want to do. I work hard for my money. The last thing I want to do is give, God. And so we kind of check that off. We're like, I'm not really comfortable with that one. Maybe abstinence. Maybe we're not comfortable with abstinence. Jesus says, you know what? This right here is what matters. That right there, there's no other way. But we look at it and go, but you know what? I got I to gotta, I gotta figure out what I want to be committed to, right? So I don't want to line up with that one. Or just whatever, go through. What is it? What is it that we just pick and choose when we customize our Christianity we have to get to the point and say, I'll follow Jesus for whatever it takes. I will follow Jesus and have that unadulterated, that, 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 that crazy commitment at whatever level it costs. But there's a lot of people in this room that say, well, I follow Jesus, but not only in the areas that I'm comfortable, only in the areas that I agree with. I'm a Christian, but I'm not all in. That can't exist. We can't be a follower of Christ and not be all in. We don't get to just pick and choose what we're comfortable with and say, oh, that's my walk with Christ. No man comes to the Father except through the Son. That's it. You have to have a walk with Jesus, a relationship, a committed, deep, intimate relationship with Jesus. And we're going to get into that just a little bit more here. We can't be a follower of Christ when you're just a fan. There's not an option of selective commitment. It's not a possibility. There's no bargaining. There's no bartering, no finagling. When you decide to become a follower of Christ, when you go all in, it's all in. Fans, they don't like the idea of going all in. Fans don't like this. They're not wild about having to make sacrifices or about having to, not, to, to deny themselves of something that they crave. Because that's the truth. There are some things in life where it's like, oh, man. And that was what verse 66 was earlier. It says, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And that's where the rubber hits the road. If you've answered why you're here, then it will be pretty easy to figure out if you're all in. If you weren't here for the right reasons, the chances are you won't be willing to go all in. So in defining our relationship with Jesus, we've asked, number one, why are you here? We've asked, number two, are you all in? And the third thing that we have to ask ourselves is this, is have you made it your own? Have you made it your own? Most of us starting to go, started going to a church for a point, for a reason. Maybe we grew up in a household that they, you know, we had a mom or a dad that you were going to church every Sunday, rain or shine, it did not matter, you were going. And as you become older, you still go to church every day, rain or shine, no matter what, because that's what you do. Let's look at this in another way. Growing up, my mom, I would ride with her every day. She was my ride to school when I was a little kid, and my mom loved George Strait. She loved George Strait. And I can remember my dad 
He loved Billy Idol. I know it's a very weird combo. And as I got older, the truth was revealed to me that, Bill, that, you know, that, that, that George Strait was good. But growing up, I listened to George Strait, and I started liking George Strait because she liked George Strait. I didn't go find George Strait on my own as a little kid and be like, oh, my exes live in Texas. Oh, yeah, I yeah, like the Stones. But, but the, my point is this, is in the, when I was a little kid, I liked George Strait because my mom liked George Strait. I liked Billy Idol because my dad liked Billy Idol. Maybe for some of you, it's Aerosmith. Yeah, some of you are like, I like Aerosmith. No one likes Aerosmith. You just, it's an adaptive thing. Like, start humming the song. It's like, even when I close my eyes, just want to fall asleep because, you know, now you're humming that song. You're, now you're humming that song. But you grew up, someone else liked Aerosmith, and now you're like, oh, now I'm really a fan of Aerosmith. But here's the thing, my point in this is, have you made it your own? Uh, uh. Maybe you started coming because of a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a spouse. You came because they liked it when you came. You come because it appeases them. Why is it that you come to church? Have you made it your own? Is it your decision? For those of you who grew up in the church or attend the church in order to appease that significant other or that relative, it can easy to really become a fan and not a follower. We come, like there's people here today. There are people here today that are wearing a cowboy's jersey because of their husband. <laughs> there are people that were wearing a Florida Gator shirt up here because of their husband. <laughs> that they're an adapted fan. They're just, you know, I like the Gator. I like the Cowboys because it makes peace in the home. My wife likes the Chiefs because it's just, it keeps the house happy. She's not a Chiefs fan. God bless her. <laughs> she loves me. But the same thing can happen with our walk with Christ. The same thing can happen with our walk with Christ. It has to be your own. We don't get into heaven because of our wife's relationship with Jesus. We don't get into the kingdom of heaven because our mom was such a good Christian. We don't get into heaven because our grandma was such a prayer warrior. We don't get into heaven because we wanted our kids to find good quality friends. That's not the way it happens. We have to have our relationship with Jesus. We have to be a follower. We can't ride into heaven on the coattails of someone else that we really love and really loves us. Jesus doesn't want a relationship with you and your mom. Don't get me wrong. Jesus loves your mom, and Jesus loves you. But his relationship he wants is with you. His relationship with, his, with your mom is with your mom. Let's look at this with just any other relationship in the world. My relationship with my wife. My wife went to uh, Beth Moore this, yesterday, this weekend. And even though she wasn't in the room, and even though I wasn't in the room, she was still totally committed to me. And I was still totally committed to her. It wasn't like this. It wasn't like, oh, phew, she's out of the house. We can throw that marriage thing out the window. It wasn't like that. Even if she's not in the room, the marriage still exists. The covenant is still true. The love is still there. The intimacy, the relationship, it still exists. I'm not in the marriage because it makes her happy. I'm not in the marriage because it makes her mom happy. By the grace of God, Julie's mom loves me. I'm her favorite son-in-law. I'm her only son-in-law, but let's not, let's not focus on the, the details. But my point in this is that, that my relationship with Julie is because of her. I own that. It's, it, that it, it, she's my wife. And our relationship with Jesus has to be the same. Our relationship, because there comes a point with, with, with young people that they're going to grow old and they're going to move away from the home and they're going to go to college or into the workplace, and maybe they're going to experience a day when no one else believes like they thought they believed, and they have to begin to determine their relationship. Why do I believe? Was it because that relationship was mine, or was it because my mom or my dad had a relationship with Jesus, and I wanted to make them happy? Or was it because my wife had a relationship with Jesus, and I wanted to keep peace in the home? We have to define the relationship. It has to be ours. It has to be yours and yours alone. That is it. 
And that can happen to us in church. We keep coming to appease someone else, and pretty soon we get into the flow of things. We know the songs, we recognize the stories and the teachings, and we're kind of fans of Jesus. But that can be the most dangerous situation to be in because if your faith isn't your own, if you aren't pursuing a relationship with Jesus and you keep coming week after week, you begin to create a faith with what someone else with someone else's, with what was someone else's in the first place. You're just numbing yourself to what is the real thing. As much as I love Julie and as much as she loves Jesus, she can't love Jesus enough for me. As much as I love my daughters, I cannot love Jesus enough to cover them. So I have to raise them in a way that they have their relationship with Jesus. It's not enough for dad to love Jesus. It's not enough for your wife to love Jesus. It's not enough for your kids to love Jesus. What is your relationship with Jesus? Are you a fan or are you a follower? I'm a fan of the chiefs. I'm not a fan of Jesus. I'm a committed follower. If no one else in the room believes like I believe, I don't care. If you don't like the way I believe, I don't care. I still love you, but I don't care because my relationship with, with it's the same thing. If you don't like my wife, I don't care. I love her. She loves me. There are many people who look at her and go, why are you married to that man? It doesn't matter. I love him. <laughs> That's just the truth. That's a committed relationship. We can't become numb to the real thing. We can't get comfortable with a few songs and a few favorite verses and none of which require sacrifice or personal change. You have to make your faith your own. Jesus isn't looking for a relationship between you and your mom or you and your wife. He's looking for a relationship between you and him. And Jesus said these words at Luke 14, 26, if anyone comes to me if anyone comes to me and does not, hate father, does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And what he's saying here is it's not about your mom or your dad. It's not even about you. It's about him. It's about him. It's about you and him. So that's my heart today as we close, as we, as we wrap up day one. We've got five more weeks of this. I want you to ask yourself those three questions. Why are you here? Are you all in? And have you made it your own? We have to begin to search our heart these next few weeks and ask ourselves, are we a fan or are we a follower? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it's my prayer today that as we open up our eyes and open up our hearts to you, Jesus, that we would examine where we are today. There were some tough truths shared today. A lot of us can, can be in the room, and that's not enough. It's not enough just to be in the room. It's not enough to just know the song. It's not enough to just know the scripture. The Bible says that even the demons of, in hell believe in Jesus, and they run. So my, my question today is, why are you here? Why are you here? Are you all in? Are you just sitting in the stands cheering on Jesus? Great job, Jesus. Or do we get in the car afterward and we look at them and go, oh man, they, I didn't really like those songs that they played. Shane's message, it was just kind of, uh. The host team, man, they didn't greet me. The chairs were kind of sloppy. Coffee was cold. Well, none of this is about you. None of it is about you. We gather for Jesus. Where are you in that? Why are you in the room? Are you all in? Have you made it yours? It's not enough for your wife. It's not enough because of your husband. It's not enough because of your children. Have you made it yours? So my question today, with every head bowed, with every eye closed, with everyone not looking around, I want to ask you this. Today, how many of you in this room would just consider yourself to be a fan of Jesus? Would you just raise your hand right now? Just hands all over the room. God bless you guys. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you for your honesty. As we dig into this in these next few weeks, I would hope my prayer would be that we would go from being a fan to a follower. 
and that is only your decision alone. There is no message that I can preach. There's no song that we can sing. There's nothing perfect that we can do that can change that in you. That's got to be between you and Jesus. And the cool thing is you have the opportunity to change that. You can do that today. You can do that tomorrow. It can be something that you can go say, you know what? I've lived my life as a fan, sitting in the stands, cheering on, being a fan of church, being a fan of of the pastor, being a fan of the the music and being a fan. But all of a sudden I'm, I'm realizing that I'm missing the whole thing and I'm not keeping the real thing the real thing. If today you want to become a follower of Jesus because you've never been a follower of Jesus and you want to move from being a fan to a follower, if that's you and with every head bowed, with every eye closed and no one looking around, if that's you today and and I can just pray for you, would you raise your hand and be willing to do that right now? God bless you. 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 Hands all over the room. I want you to pray with me and I want everyone else in the room to pray with me as well just to be a voice of encouragement and say, Jesus, thank you for loving me.